I wish to very shortly introduce our guest because it is a special pleasure for me to host here today André Detienne from the Peirce Edition Project of Indiana University, project where the writings of Peirce in chronological order are edited. It is a special occasion for me, especially because André and me arrived at the same time at the in the 80s of the past century. And we, as a young Peirce scholars, could benefit of the competence and friendship of great senior Peirce scholars, from Max Fisher to Christian Klosel and Nathan Hauser. André stayed at the PEP and was an excellent member of the staff and then became director of the project. We wouldn't have a Peirce project without him nowadays, or a chronological edition of the writings and an analytical and philological study of the manuscript like we have thanks to him. Our gratitude for his work is immense. Yes, André is more than the director of the Peirce archive and the editorial project. He comes from Louvain, Belgium, where Husserlian studies are so important, and his first works are on the categories in Peirce. He is a Royce and James scholar. He, is, he was president of the Peirce Society and the Semiotic Society of America, and editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Semiotics. He is also the developer of a software collection, Step tools, enabling the project to, to transcribe manuscripts according to a special electronic program. He recently received an important fund for its improvement. His production is large. Throughout the years, we read many articles authored by him on Percy semiotics and phenomenology, on the theory of representation and psychology. In a nutshell, today we have the occasion to hear the most representative commentator of Peirce's thought. For the Peirce Research Group, recently constituted by us here in Milan, it is really a great opportunity. We thank him very much for being here and we are looking forward to hearing his presentation. Thank you, André. Well, thank you very much for those very nice words, Rosella. I have to say that anytime actually I do see you, I also go back to those first days back in 1985. <laughs> and, and I don't know how you do it, but you haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, that's, that, that, that's, that's sufficient. <laughs> Which is a only that, that is a funny rustropic statement. <laughs> oops, oops. So yes, I am so glad to return to this topic about funny rustropy. That is something I have been studying for decades, off and on. I've not always done this, and so this was a good occasion to plunge myself back into uh, this particular topic, and and, uh, and 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 also to come to this marvelous realization um, that the subject of phanoscopy was becoming less and less uh, um, a mystery toward the world of scholarship. More and more work, in other words, have been published regarding phanoscopy uh, that do a lot more than Peirce ever was able himself to do. Uh, and so to, to come to see that uh, means that uh, something is getting validated and we are going to see that uh, 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 in part within this presentation. Uh, that uh, phanoscopy is a uh, kind of activity that seems to have a brighter future than it did a few decades ago. So this is the, uh, the plan that I will be following during this uh, uh, talk. Um, it's very simple. Um, um, I have made this particular talk so that it could be understood to people who have little uh, um, exposure um, to Perth. Uh, and and uh, there is a, a, a logical order to it, uh, introducing ourselves to what phanoscopy might be, 
with some reminders of what the theory of the categories is all about, but I will not take the time to specify that because there is a ton of literature about it and I don't want to spend too much time on this so that we can discuss more and more phanoscopy, especially in his classification of the sciences where it gets defined and actually justified. Um, and uh, we will discuss the connection with mathematics and then we will jump into what makes it so import, important to inquiry, delving into the notion of what the Fanaran is, what can we study within it, how do we do so, and uh, uh, what then makes Fanaranscopy relevant for, for not only philosophical inquiry, but just about any type of inquiry um, before we conclude about the future of that science. And so, so yes, we are first to acknowledge that for a long time, phanoscopy was mystifying, maybe still is mystifying because it was taken to be one of the white elephants uh, uh, within Peirce's philosophical system. Another white elephant was taken to be his own evolutionary metaphysics. I think it was Gouge who was the first one to treat it as a white elephant and others had the same kind of reaction. Um, and and uh, if his evolutionary metaphysics was taken as a white elephant, then a fortiori, his phanoscopy. Uh, and and, and uh, there have been a lot of confusion that took a long time um, to actually dispel because there, there is, of course, Peirce's theory of the categories, which is the centerpiece of his philosophical work. And what one wondered, uh, uh, what is the connection between the theory of the categories and, well, phanoscopy? Um, and and uh, there has always been the question, is, not, is it not just the same? Is it not simply the case that phanoscopy is the theory of the categories and that's it, there's nothing more to worry about. Um, and, and, uh, uh, and, and it was also the matter of what do we do, you know, in fan, as far as this particular activity is concerned, is concerned, is it really a science? Why would we do this and how does it work? What's the purpose of doing it? Is it useful? So the, the, that raises a whole cloud of questions. So some of those questions were these, you know, phanoscopy, you know, just the word itself would want you to simply flee the room. You know, um, and because what you have in mind is something like stethoscopy, you know, <laughs> and uh, what a strange word, you know, can it possibly mean anything? So there is first this anxiety coming from the word itself. And then, you know, is it really a science, you know? And then the question, if it is a science, how come I have never heard of it before? That's a perfectly legitimate question um, that uh, we need to entertain because there is a claim here that is being made that may sound arrogant. If, you know, if we don't have, we, if we have never learned about it, then what are you talking about? There are others who might say, oh, that sounds really complicated and interesting. Can I get a PhD in phanoscopy? In other words, is it really taught? in many universities to the level where there is a graduate program in it that could get us you know, a title. And then following that, of course, the worry is, are phanoscopists well paid? You know, is their job useful and interesting? Does it help save lives? And uh, I say, uh, well, if you are in the plane and you are feeling sick, do not ask whether there is a phanoscopist in the plane. No, uh, no it, doesn't, it does not save lives, but the job, could be useful and certainly is interesting. Some say that Perth did everything that needed to be done in phanoscopy and that everything else is semiotics. Is that right? Important question because it was simply stated as such who, by whom? By Joseph Brazil himself. Now that is one of the things he saw. Phanoscopy is really the new list of the categories. And for the rest of it, everything happens in semiotics because, because everything is representation. And that's it. And uh, he and I always uh, were in, the, in disagreement about this. And then a contemporary question, is it true that phanoscopists never assert anything true and yet never lie? So are they post-truthists? That's a legitimate worry. My answer is no, no, no. They are not post-truthists, but literally they are pre-truthists. <laughs> Of course, it did not help that Peirce himself tried to scare us by saying, I quote, the ultimate analysis of all experiences is a most difficult, perhaps the most difficult of philosophy's tasks. 
demanding very peculiar powers of thought, the ability to see clouds, vast and intangible, to set them in orderly array, to put them to the exercise. So you read that, and then you wonder, what, what, what kind of scientific object is that? Clouds, and then how do you assemble clouds together? Uh, do you have to hope that there is no wind blowing? No? Uh, and, 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 and then how do you arrange them? And then it is difficult, it is extremely difficult even, and demands peculiar powers of thought, means only a very few can do it, you know, uh, so, 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 so this, this doesn't help. And yet, you know, Aldo Peirce put it just like it is because he's right about it and it is disquieting, yet we should not be discouraged. Why? When in the first place, when Peirce says this, he is reminding himself about his own experience of struggling with what had never been figured out before, such as the CEO of the categories. Um, and it, is, it was an extremely difficult uh, uh, activity he launched himself into. He had to really learn how to observe and he had a mind that was actually made for it, as it were, unlike most other minds. And so we have to recognize that in any case, phenomenological practice is difficult, whether it is Husserlian based or whether it is Persian based. Um, and, uh, uh, but it is doable, why? Because it has been done in continental Husserlian based phenomenology for a very long time. And uh, one should not dismiss at all that tradition because there is a lot that has been done there that can actually be also transferred into a phanoscopic approach with proper filter, a, a, a special kind of translation, but we should not dismiss what has been done, say, in phenomenology. Um, and yet, on the, other, on the other hand also is that all of us have long been busy scoping the fan world, but it's simply that we, have, we, did not, we did not feel that we are doing so. We have not been trained in recognizing it, but actually we are doing this all the time. And so it is time to remove the veil of mystery. But first, very briefly, a, 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 quick, a quick reminder of what, is, what matters regarding the three categories as far as phanoscopy is concerned since the, the category structure its own methods of observation. And so let's remind ourselves that what makes person's categories special, he discovered the, the, them, let's say, in, in, in that period of, um, from 1864 to 1867, um, he was not doing phanoscopy at the time. He was simply looking for a much better answer to the question, how do we transfer from observing something that is out there, um, that is, uh, 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 and, and, and then how do we transfer that experience, that phenomenal experience into something completely different, which is a proposition about it? How do you create a synthetic judgment to use a, a Kantian phrase? What is, what is the process behind it? He was not satisfied with any answer from the tradition. Uh, he, his instinct was telling him, we need to find out how any judgment comes to be formulated, no matter its shape, no matter its logical form. We need to drill about that which is in, shared in common by any process of representation whatsoever. And, and, and in order to drill, down, to drill down deeply into the logical foundation of this event, the event uh, of producing some kind of a discourse about something. And what he discovered is that there are uh, certain stages within this move from the manifold of the phenomenon to what a logical representation of it, there are different stages that are always present. And those stages need to be captured. And when, once we capture them, then we actually have something that may deserve the term category, unlike whatever had been called category in the tradition before him. So he discovered that it was a small set of stages that needed, that, that could be unveiled. And that, uh, that small stage was actually gradually ordered. There was a gradation. And that became the principal thesis that he defended, defended in 1867 in the new list of categories, that there was a gradation. And that the new list was a new list because it was made of a gradation, which, we did, which it was not before. And one had to see that there, it was a process that was going through it stage by stage, that each stage was utterly different from the next one, and needed to be recognized and described so that we could see what was the power at work within the statute and how it made possible the next one until we came to the uh, final, um, what I call the clarified unifying intellection put into a proposition. So that is 
That's the idea of the category. They are something dynamic, they are processual, they move from one field to another, they are indispensable to each other, and they can be found through a process of induction um, and then isolated through a process of precision. Precision is something I want to dwell just a few seconds about because you cannot understand phanelaroscopy without understanding what precision is all about. It's not only about finding the categories, it is about something uh, much more important that has ramifications not only about phanelaroscopy, but about just about everything else. Um, when we do our philosophical work, some, some precisions about precision, I have adopted that particular uh, um, spelling of the word precision because it's the only one that actually <laughs> makes sense and first did adopt it um, at, at times. Um, and it, it, it reminds us that it has to do with the separation, with some kind of a cutting. What, what makes uh, precision really powerful is that it is a heuristic act of abstractive analysis. It is really done for the purpose of finding out something. What? Well, it seeks to identify the non-reciprocal logical order of dependence that govern the relations between logically distant components of anything that may come to mind, whether the categories or something else. But it is the kind of thing that you want to, to, to use in order to find out how is something moving from one state to another state? What are the stages? When you do that, you really want to exercise this, this tool called precision, you don't want to exercise other, others like discrimination or dissociation. No, precision is what you want to use. That is scalpel for that kind of surgery. You have, you have to choose your, your knives, as it were, even intellectually, and the knife of precision allows you to do certain cuts and others don't. And you have to have that to, have to, to, to know that. That's a tool to make those kinds of distinctions. And then when you do you know, you find that each such component must have a logical form that radically differs from the others. Not just a logical form, it has other forms, metaphysical forms, psychological forms, depending on what it is that you are observing. And each one cannot arise without the active determination received from its predecessor if it is not the initial stage. At the same time, each one must actually act make it possible for the next stage to come in. Um, and so it has to provide to allow for something else to happen that is utterly different from its one. It's not a repetition of the same. It is really the preparation or the empowerment um, of something else. Precision is never a fully severing cut. It stops short of a complete scission, hence precision. It stops just before that. It reveals the inner dynamic, but also the directional structure of this single part because there is a gradation which has to be unidirectional and it has to capture that in the way it is operating to show that the parts actually go from one to the other and not the reverse. So it can display the formal power that is peculiar to each one of those little hinges from stage to stage and show that they are really indispensable. Um, and uh, so, so as a consequence of this one can certainly make the case that Precision, as far as analysis is concerned, is likely the most powerful tool for a philosopher to wield. For when it is well conducted, it yields processual distinctions that actually are verifiable and they are non, not arbitrary, which means you can try to criticize them. And if you, were, you did a good job, it's going to stand because they have been shown to be indispensable for each stage. And that is something that is not simply part of your own imagination. Uh, so, so, so when you combine precision with a process of inductive inquiry, as first did in the, in the new list, um, inquiry, that inductive inquiry is looking for possibly distinct universal conceptual parts and has to fathom, well, this is coming all the time. There is something about it that, that uh, we can, that repeats itself, which means there is something that, that persists and that is something to be considered as a possible candidate for what we are looking for. And then you, you, you isolate that, you bring in precision and you check, does it have the shape that we need? Does it fulfill the logical role? Is it, is it not non-redundant? Is it non-reciprocal? Does it allow for gradation to happen, a real kind of gradation, not a fictive one? And, uh, and, and also does it show its own limits so that we know how we, when we transition to the next stage? I will not say more about precision, but I want to uh, um, encourage you to read Mark Champagne's book on philosophy of science and consciousness, 
because precision is at the core of that book. It's really sustaining the entire discussion behind it. And the discussion is all about a lesson taught to analytical philosophers about the reality of qualia. And Max Champagne shows that when you, with the tool of precision, you actually give legitimacy to the notion of qualia. So precision has multiple applications, but especially in Fanny So let's remember what the categories first are not. They are not the result of any sort of transcendental deduction a la Kant. They are not a priori. Um, it has been claimed the word. They are certainly are not when you look at the details. They are not general concepts. They are a different kind of thing. They do not result from the faculty of understanding, for instance. They are not <coughs> classes of predicates. They do not form a list of general questions to ask about some object because you know, that was the Aristotelian take on categories. We have a list of questions to ask, wonderful list of questions to ask indeed, but that's not what categories are about when you are looking for something more foundational. So what they really are, they constitute the structuring agency that generates predication, representation, signific signification, but really in general, it is explanation, the entire process of explaining something um, the stage that you go to in order to do that is what the categories structure. Um, and and, and, and as this, what they do is to move really from a, a state of something that is indeterminate. Something is puzzling, something is causing uh, to you to ask a question. What is this thing that is just there? And then you have to find some kind of an answer. The categories are going to structure those things of inquiry, starting from this time point, something indeterminate. <clears throat> something unexplained is showing up and you have to move out of that state to recognize what it is uh, making a number of hypotheses in order to find out what is it that is going to make it intelligible. So, so, so this process through the categories allow you to shed um, uh, light onto something. It makes things more intelligible. Um, and and uh, so, 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 so there is this move from any sort of indeterminacy, you can move to something else. Why? Because person's conception of indeterminacy is completely dynamic. The, the categories are dynamic, but the origin of the process that actually generates them and already constates them virtually is itself dynamic. It's not inert, it's not static. Indeterminacy is really a stage or a state that asks for its own cancellation as we will <coughs> be seeing and the categories do structure that process. In the mid 1880s, Perth began to realize that all the work he had done actually extended from thought to nature. And, and uh, that it was not simply confined to the logical and the epistemological, but it was also um, something that was relevant to <coughs> all of the sciences. Why? Because the categories govern not only what, whatever structures are on cognizing mind in its processes, it is far more than that. It is far more fundamental than that. You find them at work within the logic of nature. And Peirce constantly reminds us that our own logic is only a subspecies of the logic of nature. The same structure is in place within nature itself. And it is actually at work within the, the, the process of evolution itself. So, so, so that uh, uh, we have to look at the new list of the 1860s as only a specialization of a ma far more general process that was made more manifest to us to his work when he was as a mathematician, as a scientist, and, and to his study of the scientific methods. He discovered that uh, no matter what he was doing, the structures are always showed up, no, no matter what the subject was being um, um, studied. So that's the one thing that makes that system uh, more powerful uh, indeed is that it is not confined to the human mind. So uh, as a brief reminder, simply, I will not go into the details, but simply to, re to remind those of you who are not uh, fully aware of this, that when we talk about phenoscopy, we are going to read the categories as well. Um, and so we have to keep in mind the three major ones, which is that the, the ultimate representation of them my purse, or in the most general fashion he could, what I call the triple hypostatic abstractive generalization. So we have firstness, uh, the mode of being that consists in something being positively such as it is, regardless of what else. <coughs> there is no way to state it more abstractly than that. That is 
really a quasi-mathematical formula for what firstness is concerned. And, and, uh, and it is this ability to capture something in its own, regardless of whatever dependency it might have. We move all other dependencies. You look for that in its own, its own as it presents itself, and that's it. Um, and which means you are not interested in its applications, in its connection to other things. It's, you are only looking at, at it as it is a mere possibility on its own um, and, and uh, before any sort of actualization. One has to think about it, whatever happens was first possible. And what was the reality of that? It was not a fiction in your imagination. It, uh, it, is, it has its own reality. And that has to, to, and that has to be given um, 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 a full significance. Uh, otherwise, we have no metaphysical system possible. Uh, one of uh, the uh, institution of, a, of, a, of something that is first is a quality of feeling or quality, that's a term that person invented for the purpose. But really, in general, it is any form of appearance uh, once you contemplate it on its own sake. Um, and and uh, oops, the other direction. So sex secondness is this is the second uh, category, the mode of being that we we are going to reduce it to something very simple, something being second to some first. That's it. There is no, no, nothing more than this, but it is something that takes into account something else as, and is forced to do so. <coughs> you cannot take it, you, you cannot look at it on its own. You have to look at it at the way it is coming into existence, existence, because it is suddenly bounded by something else and the boundary shows it up as it were in a way that cannot be ignored. It is <coughs> really the mark of actuality. It's really moving from this realm of the possible to a different kind of uh, um, metaphysical condition called existence. <coughs> and, and the one has to recognize that those are, that, that is a completely distinct type of, of, uh, of reality. And, and it is not the whole of reality. It is, it is a very peculiar one on its own. Then the third one, of course, is now thirdness. And that's the mode of being that allow us to talk to each other. <laughs> it is really the mode of being of a third or medium between the second and the first. It is that which is a completely different nature of being the possible or the actual, but actually brings them together and begins to indicate that well, you know, when things happen, a possible gets actualized, but it's not out of complete um, arbitrariness. There is an order to the whole process. There is something that it, it, these things are happening, uh, are getting actualized, but not chaotically. It is orderly. <coughs> and this order itself is neither a possible nor an existent. It has the, the form of a general or the, the form of a law. <coughs> And it is that which makes everything intelligible because it makes everything representable. Uh, we are constantly uh, experiencing fairness as we are busy representing. We are using general terms that allows us to bring things together uh, under its governance. Um, so fairness is powerful in the sense that it is fundamentally a synergistic, which means it brings its continuity. It shows what's the continuum behind whatever might Appears to be uh, discontinuous. And it is also a teleological agency because what it brings into mind is what is what, the, um, as he says in the previous sentence, the future facts are going to take on a determinate general character. And uh, so the, no, the, the person's notion of the future is the notion of the real third. The, th the future is not a future existent, it is something of a different kind called generality, for instance. So, so, so those are the three uh, uh, categories in this in the most abstract form. And after that, person is going to, de to, to develop those categories more and more. Talk about the degeneracies, which I will not go into. But he is going to study them in different fields, including the logic of relations, of evolution, of inferences, of semiotics, and of course in metaphysics and even in the classification of sciences. And uh, it matters for us to be introduced somehow and just superficially, but just sufficiently um, to process classification of the science. Because when you look at phanerostopy as a science, what makes it a science, what justify it as a science, as far as Peirce is concerned, is that it has to enter into the classification itself. 
In other words, when you study the concept of the classification of science in the way he does, at some point you realize there has to be something here that something is missing. So, um, and I will certainly not discuss the very long history of that uh, effort by Perth to classify the sciences. Um, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is, he was not the only one to do so in the 19th century. We have learned that uh, lots of other people were, do, were busy doing this, that it was sort of fashionable, but Perth had his own take on it, his logical take on it, that made it distinct from other efforts. Um, and, and it's really a good effort and a nice effort. It is really, we are all talking about research, we are all talking about inquiry. Is there a, an order to it or is it, is it simply a manifold? Uh, or, is, or can we really stage the whole process of our scientific research? Are there things that need to be known first before we move to other things? Um, th that is an important question that can, cannot be really avoided even um, today. So all I, I want you to know is that uh, in its mature form, um, Peirce's classification of the sense was subtended by two major principles. The first one is better known. The second one is lesser known. So the first one is called the principle of the principle, de uh, the principle of principle dependency, <coughs> as was, it was called by uh, Beverly Kent in her initial book on the classification of sciences in Peirce. So any Heuristic science, there are all kinds of sciences, but those that are really about this, uh, di discovering something, finding out things. Any heuristic science is going to discover and express at some point a number of fundamental principles that it is phrasing out of its own observation. And those fundamental principles <coughs> are said to be fundamental because um, they seem to be uh, what they are uh, not depending on other kinds of principles and they really define uh, the, 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 that particular science itself uh, at, a, at, at bottom. Uh, such principles find their own applications within the whole range that is governed by that science, but also in other sciences, which is why also they are uh, fundamental. So any science that would, any other science that would make use of general or fundamental principles originating in that prior science will be said to depend on it and thus will follow it within a person's classific classification, understanding that this is a, pre a precisive classification. There is a stage that a fundamental um, theorems, for instance, are discovered in particular science. They have the extent to others. Those others then depend on whatever good work was done in that form of science. <coughs> and so they follow from it, that's a stage. Uh, one, from one stage, we move to another one. And that is uh, 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 one of the mechanics that is at work in person classification of the sciences, especially among the science of discovery. Now, this order of subsequence moves generally from the more abstract or the more theoretical to the more concrete or the more applied science. Um, and uh, um, it is as though the more applied science was inheriting features from the more abstract one. And that's why I say this is a, a kind of phylogenetic classification. It is a natural classification, but not a la Aristotle. Um, it's not a question of genus and species. It is more phylogenetic, which is the better way to classify <coughs> um, um, in the, the science of biology and botany, for instance, as we are now today, today doing. Um, the second principle is actually the reverse principle. And it is really important. It is what I call the principle of critical inductive validation and correction. Why? Because the order of logical dependency implies that a science that happens to make use of a fundamental principle formulated in a more abstract science, either by manifesting instantiations of those abstract principles in their own less abstract field, or by putting to use persons where the clouds of possibilities freely played with in the more abstract sciences through the exercise, which means the less abstract are really putting those clouds into the exercise, ordering them, testing them in real world settings. So such those sciences then that derive those principles from others, put them to the exercise so that they can provide that prior science with corrective feedback reasons to revise 
generalizations and reasons to redesign formal possibilities. Thus a science may also be said to precede another science if the latter provides such a critical and validating feedback in return. Mathematicians had better listen ahead of them so that they can see things they could not see. And so they can see this was not general enough. And, and, and Peirce did does this constantly in his own work. This was not general enough. I found those three categories in the 1860s, they are not general enough because they have applications that show me that I have to go back to the drawing board and make, make them even more abstract. So from the ascopy, at some point in the metric theory, uh, or the metric classification of scientists occupies a definite place, very high. Mathematics is at the top of it, and we are going to discuss mathematics in a moment. But just after that, <coughs> we go into philosophy, and the very first one there is for neuroscopy. Uh, and uh, you may notice that they are organized, it looks like, according to the categories. Um, and and, and uh, um, this, this is uh, uh, something I, I will uh, say a word in a moment about. Uh, certainly, there is a categorical aspect to it, but one has to be always cautious about that. Um, what we really have in front of us when you look at the classification is, is a general schema of research stages. Uh, and and, and uh, so to remind ourselves, this is a progression where everything depends on one another. Um, and it has indeed been remarked that the schema, as far as its top part is concerned, seems to be tricategorial, and it is to some extent. But we are also to be cautious that trichotomies abound in process classification, but also dichotomies. And not all are categorial. They might simply be the result of discrimination. It is not because do we find three things that they actually are the result of some kind of precision. So one has to be cautious about this. Uh, and, uh, but what matters is that phenoscopy is that fundamental activity. Just from that position, we can derive that as far as person is concerned, phenoscopy is <coughs> the activity that drives not only every other subfield of theoretical philosophy, but also any number, not all of them, but any number of the most special idioscopic sciences, the special sciences, whether they be psychical or physical in process terms. Um, and and uh, they, they do um, um, influence them, whether the scientists know it or not. That, that is something of, of interest. So the paradox is that few scholars are aware that they ought to study or even practice phenoscopy in order to conduct their specialized observations. But as I say charitably, the likelihood is that they do practice phenoscopy, but not knowingly, and therefore not with sufficiently appropriate skill. Because they do it, but if they knew and could be trained into it, they could do better work at observing what they are doing. So, so let's try to understand this. So in the first place, because phenoscopy gets born in the classification of the sciences, we have to, to take advantage of that position to better understand it by contrasting it with mathematics. And indeed the structure tells us that mathematics comes up with fundamental principles essential to phenoscopy. That's what the principle of dependence tells us. It also tells us that phenoscopy may help mathematicians through corrective suggestions, observational clues, and theoretical validation. But it is one thing for mathematics to be completely pure, but on the other hand, even if pure, they may still learn something and actually they have to learn themselves to observe what it is that they are observing as mathematicians. For granted, mathematics is not part of what was called senoscopy, which is another name for philosophy, um, and which, which is really the sciences or the science that seeks to observe what is familiar to everyone's experience. Philosophy is really confined to whatever is familiar to our experience. And phenoscopy is the entrance to it. So mathematics is out of it. On the other hand, one has to recognize that there are hundreds of thousands, millions of mathematicians in the world. They all have their own common experience of what it is that they are doing. And so they have their own sinoscopical uh, uh, circles. 
and uh, <coughs> this needs to be recognized. It is not as simple. As we are not making we are making precision, not a discrimination. <coughs> so shocking news for some persons: mathematicians are from the last countries too, and, and there must be some how. Ah, after all, before they come up with fundamental theorems of also, they have to conduct a ton of observations based <coughs> on diagrams and imaginative constructions. Look on the left side of that slide. That's a spiral. Who is the first mathematician to work that out? Archimedes and his treatise on spirals. And what was he contemplating? Maybe not a striking image like this, but in within his mind, which probably less, which, which was probably uh, let's say say uh, just as diagrammatic as Perseus' mind was, something did appear that uh, to sustain his observation. Of course, he was drawing it also, uh, uh, and in order to study it better. But there is an act of observation going on before you mathematize. You actually come to into presence of. A fan reality. This particular image is there, striking, and then you begin wondering about it. You cannot escape from its appearance. You cannot escape from its manifestation. The manifestation is really forcing itself upon you. And 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 uh, so 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 we cannot ignore that the mathematician is experiencing whatever is manifest as well. Actually, they are busy manifesting those forms that spring into the mind. And they can do so by drawing them. So you might say it is an artificial manifestation, still a manifestation. Uh, and and, and uh, so, so, so they are not out of the club of Fanuascopist. And yet Fanuascopist doesn't provide them with any fundamental principle. It can provide them with some kind of validation, but not with fundamental principles. Why? Because, to put it crudely, Mathematics, in principle, is not concerned with anything except itself. It is highly selfish. The world could stop existing, but to pure mathematician, that would be at most an inconvenience. As Peirce put it even more crudely, mathematics is only busy about purely hypothetical questions, tracing out the consequences of hypotheses. As for what the truth of existence may be, the mathematician does not, qua mathematician, care the straw. Well, Archimedes was killed while contemplating a diagram and not carrying a straw for the Roman soldier too full of his own existence. That is Perseus exemplar <laughs> for the mathematician. He said the eternal is for him a real potential world, the cosmos, in which the universe of actual existence, including the Roman soldier, is nothing but an arbitrary locus. The, the last quotation that is matters for our purpose is mathematics is the only science which stands in no need of philosophy, except in some branches of philosophy. Strange statement, but then he says, yeah, philosophy stands in need of philosophy at the very least. Um, so so, so, so uh, uh, the object that observe, that mathematics observe being two hypotheses actually can be called possibilia, uh, which reminds us of the first category. Um, the gets represented in diagrams, but what the mathematicians do, as far as they are, they are constant, when they are constructing such diagrams, everything they are doing depends on their own internal inferences and the, the coherence of that, that process of inferences. That it does not depend on the world of experience, except it is confined to this diagram. <laughs> That's it. And the diagram sort of floats above. And that is what they are concerned with. And so whatever they do with it is going to be you know, coherent with what it is that they are observing. It will be true of it. In any possible configuration, they are going to generalize it and come up with all kinds of ratios um, um, that allow calculations, for instance, to happen. And uh, but still, the mathematicians is only contemplating those forms, those pure forms, without concern for experience. So when, once, if you are such a mathematician, and yet, like, like Perth was, and then you say, and how do I get out of this? You know, I am completely within this spiral, but I'd like to, 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 to make it useful for something else. How do I move out of mathematics? Uh, and and, and, and uh, that is a philosophical question. So to do this, how do we move out of that mode of being? 
In other words, how do we move from the world of the possibilia to something that is more actual and that would make sense philosophically? So we cannot ignore this natural urge that pushes the rest of us you know, to this all too real world that holds us into its bondage. We want to sort it out, the world, you know, not just the spiral, but everything else. Find out how it works, what are the laws, the structures, and so on. So that's the point that we have to ask. How do we move out of the first stage? How do we transition out of it so that we can return to life? Well, you know, no worries. The transition will happen no matter what. We don't have to make an artificial move to get out of it. Why? Because of this most powerful principle, the principle of, of self-cancellation of indeterminacies that Peirce at some point stated, as I, you find this in this statement in red. The logic of freedom or potentiality is that it shall annul itself, it shall cancel itself. For if it does not annul itself, it remains a completely idle and do nothing potentiality and a completely idle potentiality is annulled by its complete idleness. Look at the spiral, not simply as a possibility, as a, as a, possi as a possibility, but look at it as a, a potential, a dynamic possible, something that can energize before being uh, 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 or turned to something actual. Uh, and, and that is how we have to take it, that something that is indeterminate or possible has to cancel itself, otherwise it doesn't even deserve to be called a possible. And that, that was, that was Peirce's uh, Pers point. Something that cannot annul itself is completely idle and we don't need it. Doesn't deserve to be wiggled, not even as a possibility. So it is going to happen, have to happen, and all it takes is for a possible to meet another one, and then boom, the clash. And the clashing is enough to, to, to install what? Well, a boundary. It becomes finite. It actualizes itself. So the actualization of thoughts of possibilia includes, among many kinds of possibilia, a special form which we can render into the term positiveness, an abstraction that results from the process of positivization. I am not ashamed to use such terms that are useful for our purposes. And so, so let's not be shy about using such words. So therefore, what follows mathematics is a scientific activity that will explore that resulting positiveness, the transition into something else. That is what needs to be studied. How do we move out? Well, there has to be a science about that. And one way of putting it is by asking these questions, how do some of the non-arbitrary forms that mathematics has made out actually manifest themselves within experience. Or more simply, how do certain mathematical forms manage to structure the Tao of experiencing itself? That, that is the question that uh, we have to ask. How does it work? And who can answer that question? Phanuoscopy. Um, and, and the phanuoscopy. Um, is something that was born in Purser's mind to a whole process that I don't need to go into the details. Um, and and uh, we can skip the first paragraph. And it was only toward 1899 that Purse began to grapple seriously with the question of what ought to be what he had at first called phenomenology without knowing too much what he was doing. He was taking the word um, from, from, from Hegel uh, and, and uh, he knew something, it is so, so about something, but we don't know exactly what it is doing, but I myself need it because we need to transition out of mathematics. No matter what I'm doing in my classification of the sciences, mathematics is always the first, but then how do we transition to something else? We need something. Is it going to be logic and metaphysics? How do we transition from a spiral to logic and metaphysics? Uh, mm, doesn't, it, something is missing. So Per says, I need to, to put something in there. And at first he used one particular phrase, the phrase high philosophy. And, and uh, higher than what? Higher than um, logic and metaphysics. So he has high philosophy precede that. And then he defines it in 1899 like this. You know, more general than logic and metaphysics, thus preceding them, but coming after mathematics, is high philosophy. There is a place where he even says, philosophia prima. And you might say, but that is ontology. So it says, no, 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 ontology is not fundamental enough. So it's something before it, something that deserves to be called 
prima philosophia. High philosophy brings to light certain truths applicable alike to logic and metaphysics. And, that's the, and it is high philosophy that we have at first to deal. Now that's how Peirce says, we need something there and that is my intuition. And so he feels precisely that one cannot transition directly from mathematics to logic or metaphysics. Some fundamental step is missing that must ground both logic and metaphysics before he had um, sorted out the normative sciences. And that missing link, he calls it then experience. It has to do with experience. He says, what is the experience upon which high philosophy is based? And then he says, well, in the special sciences, experience is that which the observation art directly reveals, but it is connected with an assimilated to knowledge already in our possession. The special sciences rely on previous theorization and derives whatever it observes from what it already knows and interprets it as such. However, in philosophy process, there is no special observational art and there is no knowledge antecedent, antecedently acquired in the light of which experience is to be interpreted. In high philosophy, experience is the entire cognitive result of living, not of thinking, but of life itself. And, and, uh, and that is where we need something. Um, and that is going to be in the, the point. Note that this understanding of experience in 1899 is not exactly the same as the final one, but what matters is that person has this clear idea that such experience is disconnected from previously assimilated knowledge. It is experience uninterpreted. It is then the very unfolding of the initial interpretation, which is uh, uh, the same as living, the very reality of it detached from prior inquiry. Um, and, 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 and that is how Peirce conceived then phenomenology at first, which was a term he used from 92, 1902 to 1904. Um, and then um, he also used other terms like phenoscopy briefly. And, and then uh, after he discussed uh, uh, um, William James' conception of pure experience, he decided that I have to distance myself from James' pure experience. It's mostly what I mean by a phenomenon, and, uh, but there are distinctions to be made there. And I want the problem is that I really need to come up with a term that is my own, that does not suffer from the baggage that has been attached to the word phenomenon you know, since Greek times. So I really need to clarify what I, what I really mean by this. I need to detach myself from the tradition. I need to detach myself from, from, well, the, from previous knowledge. And so the first thing to do is come up with a brand new term. And he come up with the word fandra and then comes the term phanevascopy. Um, but before he came up with this, he did define what was the business of that science. And that's and, and uh, because that he got really clear about in 1902 and 1903 what phenomenology was supposed to be doing, what phenomenoscopy is supposed to be doing, and he defined that most clearly um, and by focusing on what well on and I, I have these dif different quotations here I have underlined those points that really matter that phenomenology ascertains, and that matters because elsewhere he talks about the kind of teaching that phenomenoscopy or phenomenology has to bring in, there has to be some kind of security to it, to ascertain, to, to make a statement that is secure. And he talks about assured observation. It's not going to be random. It, there has to be some kind of security to it, not exactly an inferential security, but something that be, can, can be trusted because of the method that is being used and the method is going to include precision, of course, because this, which allows for something to be said that is not arbitrary. But what he studies are the elements that are universally present. Now he's talking about elements, and, and uh, we'll discuss these elements are not quite the same as ingredients of the final, but it's, it really goes to a desire for a type of analysis that focuses on that which is no longer analyzable. An element is whatever it is, but it is where analysis, analysis stops ultimately. And he, he does use uh, such terms. Um, and, but the process of, of analysis 
is at the core of phenomenology. We find those terms in the second uh, quotation. It talks about the ultimate analysis of experiences. Now, for someone like us who is not an absolutist, he must, <laughs> to use such terms as ultimate uh, uh, might endanger him, but it does not because it doesn't mean something absolute is by it. Why? Because the elements we are going to find are of a nature that are not atoms. Um, and and uh, so, 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 so phenomenology is all about focusing one's attention on observation so that something can be analyzed and then described. Description is at the core of that activity and only description um, um, and nothing more than description. But what kind of description that is something to be discussed as well. Fanneron was born in 1904, at the end of October 1904, and the first thing he did was to get to his Lidl and Scott Greek English dictionary to find the term he wanted and found, lo and behold, there is Fanneron. And then, and then uh, says, well, it is really the best term because it is the simplest expression in Greek for manifest in, in English or in French. Um, and, uh, he says there can be no question that phaneros means primarily brought to light, open to public inspection through art. And that's all he wants. Whatever is going to be the, the, the phaneron, forget about anything you have in mind when you talk about the phenomenon, uh, especially anything dualistic like phenomenon versus noumenon and so on. No, 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 it's not that. Or phenomenon against uh, a platonic ID. No, forget about that. That's not that. There is nothing behind. All there is when we are simply minding, to use that verb, is something gets manifest and that's it. There is nothing behind. That's the whole thing. And that is what we need to acknowledge and learn to, uh, to, to uh, well, observe. And that's simply what's called the final one. That's it. There is nothing mysterious behind it. Actually, it is not made to be mysterious. Um, so he says again, final is denotes whatever is throughout its entirety open to a showed observation. It has to be entirely open. There is nothing that is hidden. So he says, no external object is so open to observation entirely and publicly. So, so, so look at the book in front of you somewhere. It's not a final one because you cannot see it from every side. The final one is something else. It's not an object that you can isolate uh, like, like that. The final one is itself what? Not something that is an object, it is what? The stream that you are in. Um, and uh, one has to, to use certain words when one talks about the final word. For instance, uh, the word you are going to want to use is the word, the verb, to seem. What of the seems is going to be final? It's, uh, uh, it's better than what appearance because something that appears, uh, well, it, that, that is, there is a beginning, there is an end, and it is partial, uh, and, and that's not good enough. And something could, could appear, but it really did not. But you might say, well, I thought I saw something. So I asked, no, nothing appeared. Well, it did seem to appear. And that cannot be denied. The appearance can be denied. The seeming cannot be denied. And that then is final. You cannot question something that is simply seeming. And Paul says, the seemings is what we want to, what we are after. That's an important distinction between, say, the phenomenon that appears and the phenomenon it does not simply appear. It just seems that's the minimal requirement. Question, um, and then of course that uh, uh, manifestation, manifesting and or manifested. No, when you are within what seems, you are part of it all. There is no distinction between the subject that observes and the and 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 the object that is being observed. There is no distinction between what is manifesting and what gets manifested then? No, manifestation is the whole thing. There is no distinction there. You, 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 you cannot even make the difference between you and something else because you are within what? You are within the stream of manifestation. You cannot separate yourself. You are it and it is you at that level. So is the manifest obscure? Absolutely. It is completely clear, but completely obscure because you cannot say anything about it. You are in it. You cannot detach yourself from it. You are living it. And as it flows through, no words are flowing out of your mouth. Or if they are, they are doing so, but only finally. They are part of the stream. So it's not as though you had investigated it. 
And from that standpoint, you know, it is why it's like a sort of a manifold that is utterly indeterminate. Imagine the moment you open your eyes when you were a baby, you cannot remember this, but that was a pure final one. You could not distinguish anything. You cannot discriminate anything. You could not discriminate yourself out of it. You are it, you are in it. And that's what the final one continues to be, always and never stop doing so. Hence, we can talk about the continuous stream of manifestation as being the final one itself, continuous presencing. First, give this general definition of the final one. I mean, this general, I made it up, it com combines 10 different quotations, but that, that, that really summarizes everything that needs to be known about the final one, the way he used it um, um, in this sense. I use the word final one to mean or denote an ends, better word, no, or object, no, but object is a, a sub to servers an ends of no matter what kind, so any kind of being of any kind of modality, you know, something in the wider sense of the word thing, so something not just object, into whatever is present, present to, whatever presence is, whatever can come before the mind directly, which means not indirectly in the sense, not to some mediation, not to someone else. Um, and at any time and any, in any sense or in any way whatsoever. In other words, unconditionally, without caring about, is it true? Is it really in front of me? Forget about that. You are investigating too much already. You don't question it. You just take it in. And that's the fun one, no, no matter what. Um, on the other hand, there are times where person said, well, there is, it's not the case that we have this final one and then that final one, or I'm investigating this one for the moment, leave those other final one on the side. He says, no, the first time he talked to William Lin, but he said, my phenomenon is very near your pure experience, but not quite since I do not exclude time. And I speak of only one phenomenon. And then weeks later, he comes up with the word final one. So he, has, he says, I propose to use the word Phaneron capitalized as a proper name to denote the total content of any one consciousness, the sum of all we have in mind in any way, whatever, regardless of its cognitive value. And then again, by the Phaneron instance, I mean the single entirety or total or whole of which you, um, um, the Zoomer, have in mind in any sense. Um, so, so suddenly we have a definition of that is it's not particular. It's either not this thing or that thing. It is the entire stream as such. There is only one. He doesn't really specify, you no. Know, is it the one that began this morning when I woke up and that will end up when I fall asleep tonight? Or is it the one that started when I was born and will perhaps uh, finish that and die when I die? Uh, no clarity there. But the basic is, well, you know, at all times we are busy finalizing as it were, even when you are dreaming, there is there are different degrees of see, awareness or forcefulness of awareness, but it never stops. It's an entire stream. And uh, at the moment it is presenting itself the way it does. So there is a peak to it, but you would be hard set to discuss. And where does it begin? Where does it end? The point, the question itself is, is a point that's for us. No, it is the case that if we have a neuroscopist, there is no way we can grasp the entire fan one. Is, we cannot do that. Um, the stream is passing, we are in it, we cannot stop it. Except when we focus our attention, say, wait a second, let's try to get something out of it. And that at the very moment, there is a kind of separation that takes place within you. You are still part of the stream, but at the, at the same moment, you are putting your mind above it. You are streaming, but you are also, also taking this other point, second, a second stance, a little away from it. See, I still have this ability to think about the thinking, or, or to experience the experiencing and make a distinction between the two. <coughs> so the scoping, the scoping of the final form is take this step, we can do so. But just be aware when you do so that there are all kinds of conditions that you need to do. And then you will be focusing your attention onto something that will not be the entire streaming, but still it will be reduced to the finality of something out of it. And so if we want to scope anything, we have to recognize it's not going to be the whole thing, it's to be something that is within it busy um, seeming. And that becomes 
know, an ingredient of the final one. That's the one phrase he used. Sometimes he simply used the final one with a, a lowercase p, but sometimes he also used this term that is coming at the bottom of this slide. He says, by phanoscopy, I mean the study of whatever consciousness puts into one's immediate and complete possession. And that is a particularization of the stream, or in other words, the study of whatever one becomes directly aware of in itself, directly aware, not of the whole, because that is not awareness of something, it is simply awareness without any of. But when you become aware of, the of itself is a detachment that allows you, okay, let's look at something within it. And let's, let's be a witness of this part of the final world. And so he says this kind of direct object of consciousness, I will call this term pre-bit. And then he says, when I become aware of it, I will be aware of it, not merely before a sign of it and so on, but I will be put far key at far key before the very prebit itself, which means what? Well, the prebit, the final one, uh, is, uh, is not to be taken as a sign of anything. Well, the word prebit is, is a nice one. It has been adopted by others for this particular reason. It does come from the Latin, from the verb praebere, which means to give, grant, or furnish, but also to occasion and to exhibit. And the word praebitum, um, 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 has been defined in the, uh, with different kinds of words, including the word datum, which Per does mention, but did not want to use because it was itself too loaded with undesired meanings. He loved the word privit better than the word final one because actually it was more abstract and allowed him to talk about things that actually don't even seem to seem, or one could dispute they do, uh, uh, like certain mathematical entities that are barely uh, diagrammatizable. So, so we and the other advantage of the word prebit or prehabitum is that it also means that something that Richard Atkins mentions it comes uh, that which comes before any habit has taken place. The datum one has not become used to before it has turned itself into a filtering habit, because a habit is a preconception that would pollute the observation of the phenomenon. So yes, the phenomenon is not a sign. Um, the prebit is not a sign, but that is what we study um, as far as the final is concerned. So I come here to this section, how to scope the final one and why. Well, the final one no, is a living stream, and then we can, cannot, it's not observable, but we can observe prebits or little lowercase final one. But we, if we do so, we are going to have to inspect it assiduously because what matters is that whatever is going to come out of that description has to be secure, has to be assured. And so there has to be a focus of the mind. And that focus will engage a separation coming out of the stream, but as innocent as possible. And uh, it takes also a particular kind of mindset that we learn and train ourselves to put ourselves in because we actually have to shut down part of our brain as it were. <laughs> we really have to say, I don't want any association of ideas to come up here. I'm focusing my attention only on that which appears, which means I'm going to look at it, forgetting anything I know about perception theory. <laughs> um, and I will be ready to look at it completely innocently like a little child. Uh, however, I am guided by certain cues coming from mathematics. I, I have a purpose behind it. Phanioscopy is animated by a purpose. The purpose is to understand how do things positivize themselves? And how do I capture that? The, we need to capture something that is going to be uh, uh, so essential uh, that it will inform every other research down the road. Uh, including in the other theoretical segment of philosophy. And we all, all already have learned a lesson from mathematics that, for instance, that there are only three different kinds of relations, monadic, dyadic, and triadic, and we're not, we're not going to this, but I take this for assumed. Um, and uh, we are going to learn that whenever, whatever we are going to catch within the final um, is going to have to be somehow expressed, but expressed using the verb to seem as your auxiliary verb because you want to avoid making any sort of assertion. Why? Because when you say something that seem, you are not going to make a truth statement. You are not going to say, this is true, because that is already far more than is allowed. 
what you are simply going to do is witness that it is what I have observed can be caused into such terms. And those terms are going to be very general, not non-committing and informing. There is this structure at work within this particular passing from the manifold of the stream into the capturing of it within what I am now simply describing, testifying with what happened without turning that into a theory, without saying, telling you, this is so. No, I said, this is what seems. And, and uh, I have exercised the power of precision to see what is it, what was the dynamic at work as this thing emerged out of what was seeming and began to take a particular form that, oh, I am about to recognize it. I'm about to put a word to it. But just before you do so, you see, and, and, and how did that happen? And so you have to focus your attention on the process itself. See, what was the dynamic there? And this applies to all kinds of situations. Um, scoping the phenomenon takes training. We do this all the time, but there is a way to become more aware of how we are being aware. And, and that, 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 that is what there are lessons to be done, say, from certain phenomenology in this sense. And there are remarkable works that have been done um, in, 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 that, in that sense. But why would we do, be doing this? I'm listing here a list of purposes. The why means what for, not really you know, an explanation of a cause, but what's the purpose? And as Peirce puts it, there are great um, benefits to take from this, especially when you are trying to define something precisely. You know, if, for instance, you take one of his, mo of his most uh, full definition simply of a sign relation, and then you look at all the components and you say, is he doing semiotics when he comes with this definition or is he doing phenomenoscopy? And then you think about what is he capturing and what, where, where is the capturing coming from? And there is no denying it is informed through first the theory of relations, which is mathematically based. But on the other hand, there are all of those uh, uh, evocations coming from simply an act of phenomenoscopy. He has to experience the, the appearance of certain types of representations and then sense what's the kind of category at work here, which means, is it more the, the formal quality emerging? Or am I witnessing something that is in reaction? And I feel the reaction because there is a firstness to the reaction. Oh, and I, I, I see that the, I think that within this, there is, there is a, an emergence of generality. And, and, and so, so the firstness of firstness is, is being somehow sensed, not to your regular senses, but still sensed. Uh, and, and that is the experience of this going on in person's mind. And, and uh, that is actually driving into this, what I am doing is really this type of a uh, um, phenomenoscopic observation. Um, so it is very useful if you want to provide insightful definition and descriptions, especially uh, if you want to discover new forms, patterns and paradigms and Maria Regina has written a book of novelty. You know? <laughs> and um, and, and uh, there is a section there uh, that begin to put into the phenomenoscopy behind it. But if you want to have a chance to find new forms, how do you get new forms to come into your mind? Well, if you are polluted by other forms that are quite you know, familiar to you, you are not going to see them. So you have to put yourself into a new mindset. Let's look at this again. Let's change our perspective. Let's imagine something else. And then, whoa, I see something else. Does it persist? And how does it appear? What are the conditions behind it? That is what you are going to be doing when you are in that stage of mind. You know, um, and and uh, it increases your terminological aptness. Well, just think about first when he is doing semiotic research, but actually it is from your scar picture. He, he's launching at himself all kinds of terms for this or that particular type of sign. And then he's using one and then discarding it and then using another. Why? He is experiencing the power of the manifestation. Say, this is not good enough. That's not a semiotic analysis. That is feeling the final one and say, there is a better way to express this. Think about what poets are doing. They are trying to do exactly the same kind of thing, finding using words to evoke a stream of manifestation. Which is why scoping the final one will increase uh, your aesthetic appreciation and your normative alertness because you have to feel this is about to be true. Now, truth has its own sensation and so on. So there are all kinds of benefits to do this. I will skip this one. So 
chronoscopy is wrong and relevance for any inquiry. Now, Vince Nicola Pietro, just about in any paper he wrote, it seems, you know, um, says the categories guide and goal inquiry. And they are really a heuristic tool, which means they provide what? A schema, a map. How do we observe? Well, if we have the categories in mind and we are turning ourselves into a phanoscopist, you can allow the schema to be within your mind. It's, it's not a bad kind of presupposition because it is actually not arbitrary. And then that has been already so defended and even demonstrated. It is allowed, you can do that. That's the one filter you can have because it drives what? The operation of precision. And it, you, it gives you a sense of, wow, I ought, I ought to be able at this point to, now that I am in this categorical fundamental situation, to suspect that that is being driven by something else that if I look again, will begin to seem something general, for instance, that is driving this whole thing. Because there is a sense of repetition of the same, but, but this is, how would I capture this? And then you train yourself to take it in this way. And, and uh, so, 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 in, so indeed the categories can guide and go inquiry, even in phonoscopy, even though phonoscopy is not the regular kind of inquiry, it is uh, the most innocent kind of quest because he's not looking for truths. He's looking to simply to witness something. So to engage in phonoscopy is for us to start looking anew or afresh at anything, whether it is puzzling or even familiar, but make it puzzling as though you had never seen it before, as though you were a naive, but inquisitive and curious child. That is the best mindset. So how do you try, how do you train yourself? There are many, many different ways. I will simply suggest something here. Because after all, I say study how enologists train themselves to taste and describe what? Because that is a lesson in description. And, and there is a whole standards behind it. And when you think about how did they come to do this? Think about it. That was not a semiotic analysis. It had to be somehow a study of well, all kinds of taste and other things. Study also how perfume makers describe scents or observe an abstract painting and create for each of them you know, a list of titles that are plausible. So you observe a, a, a painting. <laughs> what, what, what is emerging out of it? And what am I doing? There is no semiotics about it, unless you are simply someone who does art in a semiotic sense and you're trying to, to find messages in the painting. That is not what phonoscopy is about. Or try to pretend to be an artist because that's a good mindset to be, to be in. So uh, anoscopy, um, that is one example. Um, and and uh, I, I, I have to confess, I took this particular um, um, stock uh, illustration and then I changed it. To, for my own purposes. This was all about wine tasting, but I removed everything and I changed and I transformed that into phonoscopic uh, language. So, so as an, uh, it's not about, you know, a logic. No, no, it's not a logic. It is simply the scoping, the scoping of the whole experience. You are not going to create any kind of theory about the wine. No, no, no. It's all about appreciating the experience of it. So you first serve the wine, as I said, you Poor the liquid final prohibit. You don't want you don't want you don't want to know the word wine. <laughs> that's always your preconception. <laughs> so, so you pull this, and that sounds more objective and scientific. You pull the final prohibit and you listen to the gurgle. No, you would not pay attention to it, but if you are going to experience it, everything matters, including what? Well, the shape of the bottle, the, the rotundity of the bottle, how it weighs into your hand. All of that suddenly. Don't abstract that. You are not allowed to do that. It is all part of it. And how this thing flows out of the bottle and how the thing pulls into the wine and begin to circulate into the glass. That's part of the, those are all the privates you can focus on. And, and simply for the aesthetic appreciation. And then you move to the visual appreciation and, and inspect the colorful qualia at mathematically grounded angle because mathematics, that's, that's ground panioscopy. And there is this little design with a little angle, 45 degrees. No, that's how you, you, you have to hold the glass to look at. Um, and so, but that is a phanioscopic trick. No, you have to, to do this to what? To allow the forms to appear. And then, and, and, and then you begin to, 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 to smell it. 
um, and to let yourself be completely be aware, but you don't just, you don't say, oh, this smells good, too fast, that's too fast. Just smell it for the firstnesses that are coming out of it. Don't judge for the, it's bad. No, not yet, not yet. You are, you are not judging. You, you are just uh, appreciating it uh, without preconception. And then, then you, 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 in, you inquire by what? Making variations as we would do in Husserl phenomenology. You vary the thing, different perspectives. So you swallow the wine, you know? So apply rotational seconds <laughs> to actualize qualitative possibilities. And then you smell again. And, and, and then see, refill your awareness with sense, precinct them and compare with stage three. <laughs> And so, so, so comparison takes place, and that is perfectly allowable within an act of uh, and, and, and you learn, and you become more and more familiar with that without making, making other kinds of things. And then finally, finally, you can put it into your mouth. Feel the flowing of it on your tongue before you taste. That too is a sense, a sensation. And then you press in all of those qualia, and, and then, if you are a professional anoscopist and says, hey, I am also an enologist, I need to describe this. And then you just let the metaphors come out of your tongue without thinking, oh, this is chocolate. You know? <laughs> and and uh, so, so for instance, uh, I took this, uh, an excerpt from a long list of terms that is used by enologists. But you think, you look at all of those predicates that are coming out of the experience. There is balanced body, the complexity of it, the earthy, the elegant, the finish, and there are hundreds of such terms. But then I looked at the, at the, the description, and then I did a, 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 an express from the last copy. <laughs> I said, oh, this description sounds third to me. No, the term balance suggests that the wine's three main components, food, alcohol, and acid, are working in harmony with one another. No question, we are dealing here with the third within that description of a particular wine. <laughs> and so you can move on from, from to, to the others. You look at the rendition of what the anoscopist came up with, um, and this is an explanation of those terms, obviously, but they are really to do with the final experience, the, not just the taste, but everything else about the wine, and that builds those kinds of lists. If you move from anoscopy to osmoscopy, Osmos is a Greek term that has to do with scent, smelling. <laughs> and and, and uh, so I don't think the term exists, but I made it up because we have to follow process ethics of terminology and use Greek terms. So an, an osmos copies, well, would be, say, 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 certainly find a good job, well paid job, you know, in, 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 in the industry of, of perfumes. And uh, we have there too, a long list of terms being used to describe all kinds of perfumes. It's just like doing wine, but you are doing perfumes. And that comes with all of those kinds of, well, final words, balsamic, creamy, fatty, untrust, florals, gumo, and zillions of other such terms. And once again, you can feel well, there is a perception of something first when you talk about balsamic. Creamy is a little more than this because there's to do with the unctuosity. So there is more, uh, uh, something more second to it uh, uh, because it has to do with the actualization of the, the way it feels. And so this is the first of a second and so on. Um, so you think about this, wow, you know, uh, those osmos copies and analogies, uh, anoscopies came up with those terms. They did not know they were doing phanoscopy. You no, know? uh, um, they did not know that we could, you know, actually look at this from this standpoint. You are looking for first and first of seconds and first of third and so on, uh, and there you are. Uh, um, um, if if a phanoscopist had been in the room, that this is this is what would have happened, perhaps. But then you see, you look at this, and then you wonder. This is the kind of thing that we are after. Now, first, of course, you know, uh, was a specialist, at least what tried to be uh, of Medoc wines. And why would he be? Well, he is really uh, experiencing this kind of thing. He's not a professional one, but he knows this matters. And uh, when you look at this and you look at what an analogist and others are doing, so there is a need for this. There is a need to inform others if you are going to buy this perfume, this is what you can expect. And the expectation has to be assured so that you don't lead people to uh, be mis mistaken about it. You know? And if you say, this, this, this is really a, a balsamic kind of perfume, there is an expectation that this is a certain, a certain range of experience that is going to be fed and not something else. 
uh, and, and Andre, so I'm sorry to interrupt you. You know that we have some space also for questions. Oh, so. oh okay, okay. That, that, that is fine because because uh, after that I don't don't have much else to say. Some of it can can come up, but uh, but I am not. I was not watching the time whatsoever in uh, uh, my enthusiasm. <laughs> so 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 sure, uh, we can stop here because you've got the gist of it. Thank you. Okay, no, I, I didn't want to stop you. Uh, oh, I thought you were asking me to stop. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 whatever. You, you, you are in charge. You tell me what to do. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, very profound, full of suggestions uh, presentation. I'm very grateful to you. I think that Maria Regina uh, will... Uh, will make uh, some uh, uh, questions uh, to, uh, to, to start uh, the discussion. Maria Regina is a PhD fellow in our university and she is working on the 90s uh, manuscripts. Uh, she, she came to Indianapolis uh, one or two years ago before the pandemic and she could benefit of uh, your competence and uh, kindness. So please, Maria Regina, if you want to start. Yes, so thank you very much, Andre, for such a brilliant, fascinating, uh, clear and uh, phanoscopic exposition of the white elephant of first thought. And to stimulate discussion, I will just add a few comments to some points uh, you made. Uh, I have especially three questions I want to ask you. Uh, in the meanwhile, I invite people who have questions to write their names in the chat. And uh, as um, it was for the previous seminars, we will give priority in discussion to the people from the University of Milan first and then to all the other attenders. So um, I said, uh, I have mainly three questions and please Andre, forgive me if uh, uh, they are not that much phaneroscopic in essence. As you told us, uh, there are some difficulties in being and becoming a good uh, phaneroscopist. So my perspective is probably too much still rooted in a, a representationalist approach. However, the first question is about the tools required by phaneroscopy. You warn us not to neglect to analyze our own tools. And in this regard, you show us how assured observation, inductive reasoning, abstractive analysis, precision are the tools required for a phaneroscopic inquiry together with description. So uh, I remember in particular the quote that you mentioned when Peirce in 1903 said that, uh, I will not restrict phenomenology to the observation and analysis of experience, but extend it to describing all the features that are common to whatever is experienced or might be conceivably be experienced, et cetera, et cetera. So um, as far as I understood, we are invited um, to describe all the future common to what is experienced uh, and might conceivably be experienced. But um, my question is what really characterize, and I know that you have already talked a lot about that, but what really characterize a phaneroscopic description? Uh, more plainly, my point is when we describe and even when we um, uh, adopting precision, uh, indeed in some way we um, are already committed to concepts. So in a, to some extent, we are transcribing in a symbolic general language, something that we first experience. So in this regard, you underline how a phaneron, I mean, first, how a phaneron or a prebit is not a sign and how logic as well as metaphysics and the other normative sciences depend on this kind of phaneroscopy, this kind of philosophia prima. So uh, if logic as well as semiotics uh, depend on ph phenomenology, it's not still clear to me how they can do it, since it seems to me that in a way, phaneroscopic inquiry already involves some representational tools. 
So from another uh, perspective, more plainly, mm, uh, my question is, can we really have a pure observation and phaneroscopic description or can really experience be uninterpreted? So by uh, um, adopting a traditional approach to the question, if there is a kind of difference in purse, and I think so, and you said that, between Fanon and science, how can we conceive the fundamental difference between what has been traditionally called presentatio and representatio or darstellung and vorstellung? I ask you this question also because we know that, for instance, for Husserl, presentation is usually associated with intuition, whereas we uh, know that intuition has no place at all in Peirce's philosophy. So the second and the third questions are very short. The second um, point is, I found very interesting uh, the quote about James' pure experience. Uh, would you say that, according to Peirce's own comments, um, that we may consider Peirce's phaneroscopic inquiry as a kind of radical empiricism? If so, it seems to me that according to James, there still remain a, a huge gap in between the that, the word of pure experience, uh, which actually it, it is described by him as a continuum and the what, so our conceptualization of the world of the pure experience. So in a similar vein to my previous question and comment, uh, where does perception, observation, and experience ends here and represent and so, sorry, where does perception and um, experience ends and the representation begins according to Peirce's phaneroscopy? And last but not least, about uh, uh, a question about uh, the, um, the peculiar science egg. I know that you mentioned that in, in the la very last part of your presentation that now you um, did, didn't present actually, but Peirce says that phaneroscopy is a science egg. And so about this concept of phaneroscopy as a science, Peirce, we all know that emphasizes a lot the role of intersubjectivity in science in general, the famous community of inquirers. So how do you think this element of intersubjectivity is present, if it is, in phaneroscopy? Um, because it seems apparently to me that uh, phaneroscopy could be also understood um, as a very solipsistic science. So those are Three questions, but maybe we can collect all the other questions and then. Well, I will, I will address your, your questions, otherwise they are all going to drop from my mind. <laughs> but I have written them in and I, I'm glad to to uh, answer them. And, and uh, so, so uh, returning to your first question, um, and which, which is the hardest question. <laughs> Does phaneroscopy actually work? You know, and and uh, what really distinguishes it from semiotic? Because after all, once the phaneroscopist is going to open his mouth or her mouth and then testify to what uh, what seemed to be uh, not the case, but to be the agency at work, um, then then what kind of language is the phaneroscopy going to take? Well, obviously, the phaneroscopist will be using regular language. Uh, and and uh, is that problematic? And and uh, that is not problematic in my view whatsoever. There is no other way of doing it unless you are an artist. But then the artist is sort of uh, say say uh, uh, reconstituting the final or a slice of it. This is I'm painting this, and this is what I saw, and that actually might be far more uh, efficient than being caught in languages. We have to, and to, to, to recognize that Peirce is right. Whenever we are going to represent the Fanon, we have to deal with firsts. And first, by definition, are indescribable. I mean, they, can, they cannot be put into words because they are matters of experience. Still, still, goodness, what have I done? I have just used the word first. And you all nodded. <laughs> <laughs> and what does it mean? It works. I can use the word first, and you know what I am talking about. <laughs> and 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 how so? Well, there is this, this this distinction between what is being the language that we are, let's say, the non-language we are experiencing, and the talking about 
the, the separation is not destroying that which is being talked about. We acknowledge it's not the same. You have to be really in it in order to get it. But on the other hand, it is possible to invite you to experience it because of the powerful evocativeness of the words I am using, which are being ushered in by the very experience that I am under. And so I may say, I am not the one talking. The phenomenoscopist will be very helpful. I am, when I say I am reporting this, that's the traditional way of putting it, but believe me, it's the final one that is talking, not me. <laughs> and and, 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 that, and that, that would say, it is as direct as can be. That is also why we go, you know, what we are, we, we are going to all kinds of spectacles uh, in order to enjoy the show. You, you go to listen to a piece of music and so on, you go to, you go to the museum, you go to a play, you are in it for the final experience in the first place. And then after that, you will discuss it with others, but you are into it. And the into it is feeding you with all kinds of ingredients that at some point are going to emerge and then be turned, as you say, in concepts. Yet it is not exactly the regular kind of concept, uh, unless you are beginning to talk about it again as a concept. But when you think about the, those words are coming out of the mouth of an inoscopist uh, or an osmoscopist, uh, they, 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 they have been standardized so that there is some kind of, of security. On the other hand, as someone had to begin, and oh, this feels like to me like it is chocolated uh, uh, or, or peppery, and they say they don't say this is chocolate. It's chocolate tea. There is a way to form the word that indicates I am talking about something very subtle. I am not talking about the real thing. I'm taking advantage of the word to say something else that is more fundamental. Uh, and and uh, so, so there is a kind of modification we can do to the tone in which we are talking as well. And to say, this is not discussion of the concept uh, or the conditions under which it can be uttered. That, that is part of the logic, but not of the scopy. Uh, but what the first thing needs to be done is, I have to talk about it, but it's not me talking. And, and we don't need to view it this way, which is why you can trust not me as an individual, <laughs> but you can trust the phenomenon that is being witnessed. Uh, and and, and uh, that, that would be for a person, the first thing uh, uh, is that, no, we cannot talk about first, but they are inhabiting everywhere. They are qualia. The qualia are being you know, sort of ne neglected or negated by, see, a whole branch of analytical philosophy. But then you have Mark Champagne coming up and saying, no, 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 they are real. But we have to be able to, to what? Well, to actually do them justice. And how do you do so? Well, through precision. And that's the whole point behind Mark Champagne's Mark argument. We can precision. That's a tool we can use as a phenomenologist. Because it focuses our attention, our, atten our final attention. And then with that, you will let the structure drive your experience as a scope of the final. It's not that you decide, and now let's take this tool, as do it as a microscope, and then you, you begin to, 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 to analyze. Uh, because as a microscopist, you are separating yourself from the thing that is there. As a phenoscopist, you are blending into it, you are merging into it. So, 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 so uh, um, um, you are going to use science inevitably. Some of them will be general, some of them, but, but for, for the most part, they are going to be as iconic as possible. Actually, when, the, the, when Percy is grappling with this, uh, he instinctively is going to turn towards his experience in the later years with existential graphs. And uh, there are passages where he discussed fun, fun in terms of the existential grasp, because that is the very experience he has of the power of such things. When you are busy graphing logical forms, and uh, why you see, you know, and how did he come to actually create this new medium for, for, for logic? That's exactly a reflection of his own experience. It's not simply an arbitrary creation. See, this is how things work for him. This is how actually he, he, he experiences them deeply. So he's putting that. This is how we can sort of reduce this final round to what? Well, lines on the graph. But the final round can be diagrammed as well as the, those logical forms can do. And, and we can do this also with, with the final round by 
putting them onto a sheet of paper. But what, do you are, what are we going to do? Whatever you are going to present and arrange on the piece of paper that will help you focus your attention on, the, on, on what? Well, that which matters for the Fenrascarpist as a purse, which means the categories are driving you know, your, your experience. And, then, and, and now I am ready for the moment of firstness. And then how is it anchoring itself in this particular seeming or appearance taken phenomenoscopically? And then you, you look, what are the, the uh, so, so how actually did it come? How, how, what made me, me within the phenomenon? What is it that actually even isolated? What, what this prohibit and not that one? Where did this nest come from? What was the cause or the, the occasion for it? What was the mass that suddenly crystallized? We are looking for something within the indeterminacy of all of those forms. Something is actually increasing its presence, is getting more forceful. That is a word that Richard Atkins would be using when he talks about the material categories instead of the formal categories, that all those categories manifest themselves with different degrees of insistency. And the insistence is itself an experience. When you move from uh, the lighter one, it is, a, 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 um, it, it, it is so, so little insistent, it's only a little, a little ghost apparition. But then it increases, becomes more and more manifest, which means there is a density in the manifestation that you can grasp, which will make it actually more insistent. That's also a fun experience. But as it becomes more insistent, the, the, the first that is at work is actually increasing its power up to the point where you can actually seize it and transform it into chocolate. You know? <laughs> and, but not until it has reached that, because at first when you are tasting this, this drop of wine in your tongue, no, you, are, you are moving it, you are, you are doing all kinds of things with your eyes, you focus your attention because you are, you are what are you doing? You are separating yourself from the rest of the world. And, and, and that's what the focus means. And that shows in your, in your own facial features. You are really concentrating, which, which means you are really leaving the room because you are into it. You are focusing entirely on it. You are letting it talk. And then things are going to have different degrees of emphasis. And that which becomes more and more resistant, perhaps because it's prolonged, because it does not disappear, is what is going to emerge. And then you are going to see that the condition of the emerging you know, happens again and again. There is something permanent to which we can trust it. All of that is being experienced, and that is what you witness and turn into, into words. Um, and and uh, of course, those are going to be signs. As there is no other, other way. But when Paul says, when you are doing this graphic diagrammatically, you make this kind of a report uh, in, in whatever way he was imagining us, himself doing. And he says, we could do, we could represent on this sheet just about anything, including, and he is then giving such kind of examples as uh, the impression that, is that a musical performance is making onto your brain. And he says, you can transfer this onto that particular diagrammatical sheet. So you wonder, and how do you graph? Well, he doesn't give an example, but it is crystal clear to him that you can do so. Um, but then, then, of course, it is not the sheet of assertion in the existence of God because the sheet assumes already that whatever is inscribed is going to be true unless you circle it. So it's not a sheet of assertion. I've called it a sheet of description. Um, maybe there are better words for this. The, a sheet of testimony. <laughs> um, we might think about something like this, but that is what it is uh, all, all, all doing. Um, it is capturing the presence and making it present again. Um, because there is a distinction between presencing and re-presencing, presenting and re-presenting. Uh, and uh, you are trying to tell you, my re-presentation is really only a re-presenting. Um, it's not going to be the same as the present, but I am not saying anything about it. There is no message. There is no discussion of it. And, and, and uh, uh, so, so that is how I would answer your first question. Um, um, your second question um, well, is, is actually sort of connected because it has to do with this gap between, between the data and the what uh, um, and, and, and the, the presenting and the, the discussion of the concept. How do you move out of uh, pure experience, um, uh, making it impure? <laughs> um, and and, and uh, when Percy is addressing James, you know, he, like, he likes it. Yes, you, you are catching something that is really important this concept of pure experience, but you are talking about many pure, little pure experience of this, this and that. Um, 
and 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 uh, uh, that's because you are a psychologist <laughs> and, and not a logician and not <laughs> funny article, but it's not good enough um and and then you have those little problems that we're mentioning but if you transfer this to the final one as such as he is then conceiving much better in contrast to to, to james then the question is there is a transition that is not simply a gap otherwise there is a discontinuity and 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 uh, so so there is a transformation as you're transitioning there and so how do you capture the passage from the that to the what you hire a final rascopist. that is the answer to that question <laughs> because that's what the final rascopist is supposed to be uh, doing it, it's a uh, uh, and, and then we say well you might say um you, you might say um um but what does it tell us about perception? No, because perception does involve a semiotics semi of perception. Um, um, and and uh, perception does involve uh, inferential processes. Some of them are abductive, others are inductive within the whole process. The, the whole genealogy of a perceptual judgment is really a, a move that brings us into semiotic territory. But I would say, well, wait a second, wait a second. From the standpoint of theory, perhaps. <laughs> but before we get there, there is not the semiotic, there is the semiotic. And the semiotic is what? The final experience of something that will at some point be turned into a discussion in semiotic science. But as you are busy discussing something semiotic, your very discussion has a funny has a funny reality. Every sign in its manifestation first gets to be final. Every perceptual judgment before rising to an assertion of any kind is first being experienced in its emergence. And it is part of everyone's final uh, because people are listening to me at this very moment. There is to it a quality that is utterly final before your brain captures it and transfers it into the semiotic compartment and tries to understand what I am saying and have associations of ideas and so on. Before that, there is the first experiencing of this whole discussion that is streaming by, and then you can stop onto something of it and say, oh, he has an interesting uh, kind of uh, an action when he talks in, in, in English. So you capture that, uh, and then you are busy uh, finalizing. Uh, uh, but th that applies to everything in, in the semi arts. Before you can reach, get, get to that level, there is first the finalization of it. Perception is itself buried within the final uh, and, and the passing from, um, say, say the, 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 the purely final perceptual to the, let's say, let's call it the more logical perceptual when it moves into uh, semiotic territory is done, I think, at a juncture that is the iconic gesture. The, the, the iconicity is really the point of transition between the two. That's where the first are being captured, indexicalized, and, and then symbolized. But that too is a final experience until it transitions into something of a different order. Um, um, so so that, that, that would be the element of answer to that question that could be answered for many more hours. Um, and uh, um, if you want to talk about the science egg, do you want me to show the last slide of my presentation? Yes, but maybe there are other questions. Okay, okay, because I, I can talk about it, but uh, I want to leave time to others. So uh, I think that the first one is Alexander. Or, or Rosella first. We we are supposed to close at six, but if Andre is available, <laughs> we are glad. Um, uh, that's not a problem for me at all. Okay. Um, uh, yes, Alexander. Hello to everyone. Hi, Andre. I see you're still in the basement. Yes, so Alexander, you, you have to know that Alexander spent, spent several months in the basement in the past. We had the greatest time together. <laughs> oh, poor you, poor you. No, I, I seriously have only half a question because uh, Maria Regina already asked the most important questions. Uh, so let me see how I want to approach this. 
Okay, in, in logic and in semiotics, the instruments of thought per se, I think in the neglected argument, are razor blades. So there is always some kind of risk in doing this analysis, risk of cutting ourselves, so to speak, if we, if we do it badly. Are there any sharp edges in phaneroscopy? Can we, can we, do we risk anything while doing it? And can we get hurt? So this is my small half a question. Well, this is where we are asking for a phaneroscopic, <laughs> phaneroscopist in the room. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but principally, um, 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 I, I have, I do nothing, unless you are taking drugs to cheat your way into the fan world, <laughs> Um, I, I do not see that there is any danger in the first place because the act, say, of precision uh, um, does not require a, a knife made of metal, um, but it is actually a kind of separation that we need to be very much aware of. Because whenever I happen to, to teach uh, a person's theory about the different kinds of mental presentations, I always take the, the, uh, uh, the metaphor of knives to make it clearer to them. Why? Because it's almost never thought in philosophy 101. Uh, what is not thought? The different kind of analysis, the different kind of separations. Uh, um, and I find it wonderful that when Peirce began to discuss the categories, one of the first things he did out of his professional conscience was to discuss the distinction between dissociation, discrimination, and precision, because he understood that what he was about to do had to be crystal clear about what operation is driving his distinction of the categories. And what mattered is that it not be, it be, it be not cutting, that uh, what's going to be shown are say separations that hang on to each other. So if you were say a, 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 a funny a, a surgeon and you get to do a surgical operation that's going to do justice to the phaneroscopic approach, the kind of scalpel you are going to take is not to be uh, um, a, a one that cuts quickly. So it's not going to be a scalpel, that's too dangerous. You are going to are in danger of cutting something, separating it and then, whoa, what did I do? The person is dying. And you are not going, no, actually, no, no matter what you do, you are not going to stop the phaneron from streaming anyway. <laughs> And, and uh, that will be the danger of cutting. Oops, what did I do to myself? I am losing the final one. That will be horrible. Uh, no, you don't do that because what we're looking is for the logic, if we can use this word metaphorically, of the uh, coming into seeming. We talk about coming into being, uh, but person says, wait, wait, before we go into ontology, we have to talk about you know, the coming into seeming of what we end up to be said to be. But before we determine something is, we have first to be clear about, and where did that come from? Hence, phaneroscopy precedes metaphysics. <laughs> uh, and he's telling Aristotle, no, 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 ontology. Uh, uh, so you, you, you talked about prima philosophia, where, where, uh, uh, philosophia prote. No, 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 you went too fast. You went too fast. Uh, uh, there's something just before that. And, and uh, uh, but to do and appreciate that, see, what we are going to have to uh, uh, understand is that no matter what theory you want to evolve, philosophical or otherwise, you have to do see, your, your, your work, your preparation of thought, as, as the phrase that Persis uses. And I think that he sees phaneroscopy as the preparation of thought that anyone who wants to investigate anything ought to be doing first, even if you are in the special sciences and thinking, okay, I'm going to turn to the microscope and look at things and say, wait a second. Do you know what you mean by looking at things? Are you be, do, do you realize that you might actually not see what is to be seen because this machine was built in order to hide things <laughs> and so that you can focus on something. So there's, some, there's something good, good about it, but you have to know professionally that you may be missing something. And that is how science progress very much. No, we are missing something because things are not falling together in the way we predicted. We, we are in need of looking at again, which means there is something that we fail to present. There is a stage within the, the development of this phenomenon that we ignored, maybe because of the filter we were using, uh, but something is not right. That, that kind of experience that something does not fit the theory is 
we have to go back. And that's a common phrase. But then we can say, when you say we go back, you are going to back to what? Well, we have to revise our theories. Remember a theory, that's a theoria, that's an act of observation in Greek. And so we have to revise how we have been theorizing, which is really observing things. And how can you reset it? Because it's really, you're asking, we have to reset the whole thing. At least a portion of it, the one that is causing trouble. Well, we, we have to see, how are we going to observe that which we failed to observe, but that we can predict is actually interfering with the observation? And then, uh, well, as long as you are going to get back to this question using the same tools, you are not going to have an answer. You have to turn back to your initial innocence. And, and, and uh, maybe you cannot do it. Then ask someone else who is more innocent to do it for you and say, look at it without this, any kind of prejudgment uh, out, of, out of your magnificent ignorance you are going to see something that I will fail to. And often that is what happens. Somewhere, someone elsewhere say, ooh! And the ooh is a final moment that says uh, that can be shared. I think we have something. Um, and uh, I, for instance, just yesterday, there is, there is a, a reason to suspect that the uh, theory of particles was not good enough, that's, that there is a particular kind of particle, a muon, that behaves not according to theory, that there is a slight variation and uh, first we have to see whether that slight variation persists to many kinds of experiments to see whether it was not simply a, a fluke. But then if it does, then we know something is missing. There is another, possibly another particle here that is exercising some kind of a force that we completely ignored uh, and that prevents this thing from behaving the way we thought it had to do according to our theory. There you have something, something that is happening that is suddenly, oh, this does not coincide. And then, goodness, it will take 20 years and billions of dollars to invest to find out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All of this for us to put ourselves into a situation where some form that is at work has to be there in order what, to increase the intellig intelligibility of what we had been observing. That uh, the, something is not right means there's something we don't understand. I mean, there is a form there that either we misrepresent it in our icons, because the icons that we are using to represent it can actually hide the things they want to represent because we may be focused on the wrong form within the icon. Icons have all kinds of forms, some of it relevant to the object they are standing for, but some others not. And we may be mis uh, mislooking at the icon uh, because the icons first and from the whole experience before you begin to point what at its representational power. It has to do with quality science and quality science, uh, they may be called quality science, they are fun. <laughs> um, so, so yes, well, that's a long answer to your question, Alexander, uh, but no, you are not going to bleed to death um, <laughs> while conducting a phanoscopy. I don't see it that way, unless you find out something that is so mind, that breaks everything that others are going to be really mad at you, then you hide yourself until the time they want. Thank you, I feel much reassured. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's my turn. Yes, Rosella. Um, very, very briefly, because uh, you already um, re re replied in many different ways. Um, my question is a question uh, maybe to Perth and not to you because your presentation was excellent. Um, but uh, don't you think that phaneroscopy in Perth uh, is a science uh, in which is prevalent uh, the reference uh, to firstness, to firstness and secondness, because uh, he um, talked about the manifestation, observation, the sense of uh, immediate experience. And it's true that, uh, as you uh, quoted, uh, he uh, talked about uh, the cognitive result of living. And he said that also interpretation is a kind of experience. But then I think uh, 
he uh, he loses the, this uh, um, this uh, horizon very large, uh, in which maybe um, he could discover something new. Um, the the maybe also a, a different uh, link between phaneroscopy and semiotics, because we know that the representamen uh, is only a part of the uh, sign of relation. And every representamen is recognized as such when an interpretant comes to link the representamen to the object. So don't you think that uh, there is a not perfect balance in phaneroscopy between the first aspect and the secondness and the third aspect? The third aspect, the sign aspect, um, is uh, uh, in a way um, uh, depotentiated. De uh, well, this is where we get into the, the, the core cool difficulty, because when Pastel warns us about that uh, this is really difficult, uh, when you look at the list of questions that he asks or that he formulates, you know, how would a, a, a phenomenology or phenomenoscopist function, uh, uh, what kind of question they would ask? They would ask about the firstness of this and the secondness and the thirdness. And then for each answer, he would, uh, we would go back and again, ask again the same question. What about the first of the first, the first of the second, the first of the third? And then and, 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 and there is this kind of recurrent kind of question in which he also applies to his uh, um, 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 semiotics. Uh, he also, when, when we are looking at all the types of signs, there is that, that same kind of recurrent process, which is shaped in the same way in phenoscopy and in semi semiotics. It is, it is the same order of precision uh, drives them. Now he does uh, uh, he, uh, he, he does define phenomenology that term um, in 1903 um, as uh, the observation of whatever appears of the phenomenon in its firstness, while the normative sciences are focused on uh, whatever appears the phenomenon in its secondness, and then metaphysics focuses on it in its thirdness. So that is highly puzzling. Uh, but then one has to remember, wait a second, what matters for phenomenology or phenomenology is the appearance for its own sake. That is why a discourse about it has to be detached from everything else, because we are focused on witnessing what is appearing. And then, of course, that is the phenomenon in its firmness. But lo and behold, the final one itself is, well, sure, or, or let's see, emerges and is structured or say, uh, the door of it is made of the three categories. Uh, 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 it is not as though the third category or the second suddenly uh, emerge outside the final one and, and or the, that the whole thing is governed by yet something else. No, they are all within it. The final one already contains in itself everything that needs to be, that it needs in order to become intelligible to transition from the final one to you know, a semiotic experience that turns semiotic, um, all of the ingredients have to already be within the final one. If we are experiencing some kind of orderliness within the final one, that, that is a third at work. And so what, how are we experiencing it as a first of a third? So, so, so that, is, that would be uh, the initial answer to this. Yes, we are experiencing firstness, but not only the first of a first, it's also the first of a second and the first of a third. And we are trying to limit our witness, our, tes our, our testimony to that, knowing full well that once you move to something else, like, okay, let's now look at the real impact of what has just been happening in front of us. And then that we are talking about what, well, the real event, the one that just happened and that has caused all of this trouble. At that point, you are no longer going to be uh, doing uh, scoping the final one. You are being awoke, uh, awoken to something else, which is, oh goodness, this was terrible, uh, and and then you, or, or this was ugly, or this is uh, this is something that I cannot I cannot handle, or this was so 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 I can, or, or this was so wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. This is where you enter the realm of the normative because you are de dealing with uh, that which structures 
uh, the, uh, your experience of the actualization of it all and the impact that it has. This is the moment where you are separating yourself from your, from your final round. Within the final round, there is no such separation. But the moment something happens, well, you are being hurled out of the stream and focused onto something. You just, the, the, the whole stream is still there, but becomes a complete blur. You are not focused on the, on its blurriness becoming less blurry. You are focused on something that is crying for attention because it is not blurry whatsoever. So that is a different kind of philosophical situation when you enter into the normative sciences at those three levels. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very good <laughs> reply. There are some other questions, so I will, uh, I think it's better to go on. Uh, Matteo. Who is the next? Matteo Santarelli. Okay, thank you so much for uh, organizing all this and thank you for your beautiful intervention. And my question is about the connection between uh, PERS uh, and UWI, because I, my, my general framework, I, I think that UWI was more influenced by PERS than many UWIAN scholars will be <laughs> open to acknowledge. And I see here, an important connection between the way you reconstructed the idea of aneroscopy and Dewey's concept of uh, situations. Because we know that for Dewey, the concept of situation is not only a key concept of his uh, psychology and his uh, social theory, but it's also an important logical uh, concept. And uh, when, he defi when Dewey defines uh, a situation as a situation hmm, in a more general term, in qualitative thoughts, Dewey uh, writes, uh, I'm quoting, uh, the situation as such is not and cannot be stated or made explicit. It is present throughout as that of which whatever is explicitly stated or propounded is a distinction. So his idea is that uh, situation comes before object. So the first thing you have uh, is like the experience of something merely as a situation. So the only thing you experience of a situation is the fact that it is a singular situation. And then after, object emerge and can be constructed. So my question is, uh, uh, do you think that maybe trying to mix uh, you and birds, uh, do you think that we can say that uh, experiences of a situation in Dewey's sense uh, belong to the subject matter of uh, phaneroscopy? Or uh, maybe situation is too determined even to be an object of phaneroscopy because it is a situation. Because uh, I, I think it's interesting because sometimes when people talk about the concept of situation in Dewey, they downplay this uh, phaneroscopy <laughs> dimension and they focus on the pragmatic dimension and so on. But I think it's very important to understand what Dewey had in mind uh, when he talked about situation. I was wondering if situation are possible uh, subject matter of experiences of uh, paneroscopy. So I hope it is clear. Okay, thank you for that. Good question indeed. Um, and uh, because in the first place, J John Dewey was one of, um, was a poor scholar. And, and, and in what way? When you, you read Dewey's um, reviews of the collected papers um, soon after they were published in the 1930s, and his reviews of all the reviewers of the critical papers, do his reviews are the best ones. The, the, he manages to understand what Peirce is doing. I mean, he he is trying actually in this. He has a few, he has a number of papers focused on Peirce's philosophy in those days, and uh, he's not trying to to discuss Peirce from a distance. He is trying to present what Peirce is doing as correctly as he can manage, uh, as though he was indeed uh, 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 as he, as he was in certain ways, you know beginning to learn first and say this is really important and 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 so he his, his reviews and other papers about persons categories you no know, uh, it's really a, a report about his own discovery of what is going on in purse and knowing that others had been misrepresenting purse um and and and, and uh, that it was important to get it right because he saw what was happening um, and to, to him, it was an event too because he did not have a good experience of purse when they were at johns hopkins university uh, university in the 1880s. That did not go too well. Uh, uh, he, it was the, he could not fully really, uh, um, swallow the logic that Peirce was teaching. But then later on, he, when the 
collected papers came, that was a huge difference. And so some people have talked about the connections between, or these, let's say, how PERS may have enabled uh, um, 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 Dewey's uh, uh, logic of inquiry, uh, because there are all kinds of connections. When you are bringing up the term situation, and it's, it's not a term that PERS would have used, um, maybe because it's, it's, it's a, he would, have, he would have said the same thing to James, not rigorous enough <laughs> from, from this type on, but on the other hand, by what uh, do we means, per se, well, you know, this term is a bit too indexicalizing. Uh, so, 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 okay, uh, maybe what, maybe uh, uh, using persons on horrible word after all, a pre bit would do it. <laughs> but what's the, uh, because, but to, to do justice to how do we is characterizing it, which is really a slice of indeed the stream of the presenting. This is the whole presentation. He wants to insist on the holistic aspect of it and to acknowledge that it's really a complex of possible parts, and then everything will depend on what are the parts you are going to focus on in order to get to discuss the dynamic at, of it. But we have to realize that whatever we do out of that is going to be a reduction of it. And, and, that, and, and certainly, one has to say that is, this is a phenomenological or phenomenological instinct that is at work. This is why also I keep saying, most people are phenomenological anyway, especially the great philosophers, whether they use the term or not, is going, is going to show. And that's a, a, a portion, that's a good example of something, an instinct that is showing that he doesn't have the right word uh, or the right word at first, but he is doing everything he can to represent it correctly. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, so um, the next one should be Claudia, but maybe we are running out of time. I don't know. What do you say, Rosella? Not, uh, not out of my time. <laughs> okay. No. Uh, you are on mute. Um. <laughs> Uh, a short question and a short reply. Why not? <laughs> so please, Claudia. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for this discussion. Uh, my question is kind of similar to the one of Matteo, but it is a, a more on a comparison between uh, Peirce and James. And in particular, I was thinking about uh, what do you think of the possible relationship between Phaneroscopy and the idea of pure experience. And in particular, I was um, kind of intrigued while you were talking by the fact that uh, for, like, as I understand your presentation, in, in first, um, phaneroscopy can be analyzed by pre precision. So there is a, a clear um, logical tool and uh, a tool from the categories, from the analysis of categories to analyze uh, the Phaneron, um, whereas maybe there isn't such a clear tool in James, I'm not sure, and I wanted to ask you what your thoughts were. If it's um, too broad, we can talk about it another time. No, I can, put, I can provide a, a, a short answer, certainly. Um, and and uh, um, I see that Dewey is really a plus scholar, but James is not a plus scholar. <laughs> and, <laughs> He, he has all kinds of great instincts because after all, you might say, James is a great phenomenologist in his ways of describing all kinds of psychological phenomena. It's amazing. And so, so there is a great source there that, is, that, that one has to read with great pleasure. And, and I think Peirce was experiencing that kind of pleasure, but the, also the irritation that it's all uh, literary. <laughs> and so when when, so, so he doesn't. He has that distrust, that automatic distrust in how James is operating because there is not a good sense of logic, not a good appreciation for this. And Peirce's message was: if you are going to study my pragmatism, uh, you know, realize that it is not arbitrary because it's, it is actually based on logic. It's not. It's not Perseanism. It is what it is. It's logic at work. And if you study that, your own pragmatism, James, would actually get better. You would have a better future. He sent the same same message to to, to Ross. Anyway, so so um, the conception of pure experience and other things in James would stop by saying those are great instincts at work. I agree with this, but we need to reinforce this. Now you are mentioning a tool of precision, 
Well, think about um, so another phenomenon, is, of course, Husserl and the what? Aedetic reduction. Uh, and and, and uh, there you also have great instinct at work, but far more precise, because here you have a particular operation of abstraction, a kind of reduction down to an essence. And then you wonder, is not that the same that person is doing? When in the first place, person would never have used such a term as aedetic, uh, uh, and person person like Husserl is a logician. And that is again and again, always the capital difference. With Perth, we have something that is less, less, uh, no, let me see, more precise, less blurry. We can talk about essence and Perth avoid the word. No, um, and it's not good enough. Uh, and, and, and it has to be more pinpointable, which means we have to go back to the tabula rasa, to the drawing board and say, we've got to get a better mastery of those forms. Precision is actually the kind of thing you want to do, but you have also to grasp exactly what happens when you make those distinctions. And plus, now it is from medieval times, and he wished others to pay attention to this. But when you know uh, you go ob over the new categories, you look at the, the paragraph. Say, let's keep this. Let's keep, let's go to the next one. <laughs> and and uh, why the instinct is not there. Um, and and uh, but then again go back to James and say, okay, let's put my Persian filter and good, no, this is wonderful. Um, I can make those corrections. Um, that, that, that has been my experience with many other authors. You put your Persian cap, which means you put your, try, your the categories cap and you can see, oh, actually we can rephrase this to get it a little writer. And this is where you become a better critical thinker. You can go back to James and say, we could rephrase this in this way and still capture what you had in mind but it becomes more precise. And when Perth says, pure experience, oh, um, we can rephrase this. So you think that Fanaron can be seen as a rephrasing of pure experience in some sense? Well, certainly Perth reacted to James uh, when Perth was still using the word phenomenon, <laughs> but that particular interaction took place after, um, James, James wrote this essay on pure experience in two different articles that followed one, one after another. Perth's reaction took place just after the first paper was published before the second one appeared. <laughs> and so he was reacting to the first one uh, and, and he set him a thinking. Um, and, uh, uh, and so, so, so well, uh, uh, part of the problem is, you know, I'm talking about, uh, about one phenomenon and then he put the word phenomenon uh, um, between scale, scale quotes. Already knowing this is not a term that's going to help me, especially if I want to get myself understood to James and other philosophers, the word is not good enough. Uh, and, and it's the same kind of problem that Royce encountered because of his use of the word absolute. At some point, his absolute stopped being absolute, but most philosophers did not notice and then relegated to the trash bin. <laughs> now, nowadays, we know at some point, first, uh, Royce removed the problem from his conception of the absolute when he did what? When he went back to Perse's new list read it very closely and is really the first person on earth who understood the argument of the new list and jumped onto the concept of the interpretant and say, ha, huh, I always had in mind the idea of the community of interpretation and that becomes a rephrasing of the absolute in rise. Um, and the community of interpretation is um, in another sense to answer a, a question I could not answer uh, was uh, the community is the answer to uh, uh, solipsism, the phanioscopistic, the phanioscopist <laughs> the, 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 the solipsism. There is no solipsism. Whatever is the final is open per se to public inspection. Uh, and and uh, which means that not only am I in my stream, but it's not my stream. We are all in the same stream. That's the, the fantastic thing about the peak of the present. Hey, look at this. We are all here at the same time, no matter when we were born. The whole universe is at that same moment, at least in our current representation of things. Maybe there is another way of coming two seconds be behind us and we shall never know about. But magically, whatever up is, up is at the same time everywhere, not before, not after. So the stream itself can be infinite um, in all directions, time-wise and space-wise. We don't really know the limits of it. But uh, when we say there is only one phenomenon and he said nothing else, I, it's not even, I think, restricted to one individual. 
we are all witnessing the same stream from different perspectives, and we are going to the different worlds and so on, but we are witnessing about the same thing. And if we do so uh, from the standpoint of an Eurasian which means really humbly and acknowledging this is just one way of putting it, there is no truth or falsity to this, then what you are saying, if it, if, if it was done really uh, 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 responsibly, which meaning using the tools of precision as deeply as you can, it ought to be reliable. And that's what Per says, it is an assured observation, which means it's shareable and others can repeat it and improve upon it, but at least you can, th that was the whole idea. I think that the community of Panuraska <laughs> is already present, it is all of us. Some more training might be required. There is actually a discussion going on on, on the Per's list uh, uh, at the moment, which is, the following a call from uh, Gary Wisman about it is time to come up with with uh, a training in the practice of phenomenoscopy. It's one thing to to uh, discuss the theory and people like Richard Atkins and others have, in, have done wonderful work in that direction. But if we really want to 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 take to, to bring people's attention to it and increase the circle, you have to show the goods. <laughs> And, and, and uh, which means we need uh, applications of this and show that some kind of inquiry done in this way has allowed a particular form to emerge that was not really observed before. And that can be, if it, and it may have already happened, but we can rephrase this in person terms and to clarify. And now this, since this has happened, do notice that there had to be a third at work here that has not been, been expressed yet. Something is calling for that. That's, a, that's the kind of service that the phonoscopist can, can do to bring attention to what is missing, what are the missing links. But then by putting that into a discourse that is far more rigorous and, and, and saying we are all in this together and we can, we can trust ourselves professionally according to the standards applied to phonoscopy that have yet to be written. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so we. Um... Our uh, seminars uh, have uh, as a title, Philosophy of Practices is exactly what uh, you are referring to. I'm very happy. Uh, Andre, thank you so much. Uh, your words uh, were um, inspiring, insightful, and uh, we are very, very happy to, uh, to receive the, you here. And thank you for your time, your passions, and thank you to everyone for the participation. So, well, I thank you very much in return because um, this kind of event um, is what gives sense to my life otherwise. <laughs> it's one thing to be buried in the famous basement that is cold and leaky. <laughs> it's another to, okay, here's an, an occasion where the community that is behind me is showing up and I need that to boost myself.